it. So my name's Chris Jones. Um, I'm the CEO at Actify, and as we said, uh, as it says up there, we're the product data intelligence company. Um, so when um, Plex approached me about doing a presentation in this slot, um, the whole idea was to go through some uh, real-life customer examples of how people are taking their information from the very front end of the design process through and connecting into Plex. Um, but they also asked me to try and make it more um, industry relevant and some of the industry pressures that companies are facing on why people are actually doing what they're doing with our solution in conjunction with Plex. So that's what I've, um, I've tried to do. And I've already pressed the wrong button, so that's, uh, there we go. So uh, the year of the customer, I, I stole this strap line from one of our customers, and it might seem a bit, you know, cliche and old hat because, you know, customer is king and all that stuff. But I think right now where we are in the manufacturing sector is that there's so much global competition, you really do need to put the customer first. And there's a lot of pressure on manufacturing companies to perform from various vectors that are really squeezing and making it very difficult for manufacturing companies to be successful and um, beat the competition, basically. And I'm going to cover some of that in the next um, 40, 45 minutes. So the presentation, as I mentioned, I'm going to go through some industry trends on where I think the, the pressures are coming and the challenges that we're seeing in the marketplace that are affecting manufacturing companies. And then we've taken several of our customers that are also uh, Plex customers, and I'm going to go through some of their user case, what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and so on and so forth. Now, these companies, you can say Mint Group, Creative Foam, Challenge Manufacturing, they're all what I would call medium manufacturing companies. Uh, Mints have got facilities in Michigan and uh, Tennessee. Um, do a lot of their, they're a Chinese company. A lot of manufacturing is done in, in China. Um, automotive, Creative Foam, as the name suggests, they, uh, they've been growing really rapidly over the last few years. They use um, bonded foam in many of their products. And uh, as the automotive sector has sought to be uh, you know, lighter vehicles, etc. They're seeing a lot of work in, in putting these like foam trunking, for instance, into automotive. Also, um, those large um, propeller blades that you see on wind farms, you know, the inside of the propeller blade is typically a composite or a foam. So they're doing a lot of that work. Challenge manufacturing, tier one automotive in Michigan. Um, 3,000 employees approximately. I think they're the 50th, 50th largest uh, employee-owned company in America, so that makes them quite interesting. The other thing about them is that there's 3,000 people and over 1,000 robots, so very automotive. And they're all sort of in the automotive, aerospace, medical uh, industries. So, you know, they're the um, examples I'll be giving in the back half of the presentation. So... Question is, how did we get here? And what we've seen is since 2008 and the crash, um, every piece of spending that a company does is scrutinized to the nth degree. And whereas in the past, people would say we need a complete solution, be it software or something else, people are now making compromises. If it does the job, I'm not going to pay another 50% to get the extra 20% done. And so we're finding that spending is far more scrutinized than ever before. And quite rightly, manufacturing companies are saying to software companies, well, I'm not going to pay for something that I'm not using. And this has been interesting in that the cloud is also pushing those economics because um, I'm a big um, proponent that the... Um, software company's business model should be more in line with a manufacturing company's business model, right? And in the past, I'd sell you some software, I'd get the purchase order, I'd, you know, my job would be effectively done, happy days, they've got our software, it's all on you guys now. Your side of the table, it was all about, well, I've got this software now, 
how am I going to get any return on investment from it, right? So our two business models were completely out of sync, and manufacturing companies have started to realize that, uh, that this has been going on for the past generation, and actually, guys, no, you, Mr. Software Company, need to put more skin in the game, okay? Your profit and success should be more aligned to my profit and success, and we've seen that a lot uh, in the last sort of few years. And on the technology side, you know, the whole Internet of Things, data, 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 it's just exploding. How do we, you know, and I'm including we as a team here, how do we make better use of this information to improve our business? <clears throat> now, I wasn't sure how to put these arrows on this screen, whether they should be pulling a manufacturing company apart or squeezing it. But I see three main vectors that are really pushing the industry right now. The complexity of the parts that everybody's manufacturing, which is just getting crazy. People, which I think is a huge, huge problem. And then data, which is just growing and growing and growing. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to make use of it? What can we do from a business perspective with all that data? So these are the things that I think are, are really hampering manufacturing companies growing and moving forward. Now, I don't want to get into politics, but because I'm not from America, I feel I can a little bit. When I heard candidates on the campaign trail, and it was my first presidential election being in the States, so I found that really fascinating, um, about making more jobs you know, in manufacturing, and you've got this graph from the... Um, my pointer doesn't appear to be working, but you've got this graph from the, for those that people can't see it that back there, this is the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is manufacturing job openings against the hiring. It's not a question about jobs, it's about people to fill the jobs. I'd like to do a quick uh, show of hands here. Companies in this room, how many of you are actually looking for people right now? Right? The competition for new hires is fierce. Just about, I want to say, 80% of the people in the room put their hand up. And this is, this is a major problem. And I think there's six basic reasons why companies in the manufacturing sector have problems in, in closing this gap. The first three, education, education, and education. Whoops, accidentally pressed that. It's a huge issue. And the throughput of of graduates is not happening enough and then when engineering graduates come out of school they've got choices they've got a lot of choices an engineering graduate you know is typically smart with maths they're a good problem solver they can go anywhere and manufacturing is seen as not sexy right you don't see many Ferraris in engineering manufacturing car parks whereas if they go into finance or they find a good software startup you know who knows so that's one problem the other problem is the big and small problem. There's 250,000 manufacturing companies in the US, approximately. 90% of those have less than 100 people. And when people interview graduates, they would prefer to join a big company with a name that everybody recognizes as opposed to a small company. And this is another reason this gap is here. So if they've got a choice between joining GM or Ford or GE or XYZ Plastics from Troy, Michigan, if they don't get the big job, then they, there's a good chance they'll go, to another, they'll go to another industry. And the other really wacky fact that I discovered recently, that when people did interviews with grades coming out of um, uh, university with engineering degrees, is they're not so keen, and I find this really hard being of my generation, they're not so keen at uh, going to work every day, doing nine to five. <laughs> now, people laugh, but, you know, with a manufacturing company, you're cutting metal, you sort of have to go to the office and be on your drawing board. Sorry, CAD system, I'll show my age again. And, you know, you're cutting metal and you can actually physically pick up the object, right? Well, often they don't want to do that. You know, if they were the software company, they can roll out of bed at six, you know, at ten o'clock in the morning, sit at their desk and work from home. And that is another another issue. And the problem is not going to get any better, right? 
In the next decade, the research suggests that the manufacturing uh, sector is going to generate another 3 million jobs. How many of those are going to be unfilled? Their best guess today is 2 million. So this is going to get a huge, a huge problem because the gap's going to increase, the competition for, in, uh, for talent is massive, and it's an interesting fact that Russia produces twice as many engineering graduates as the US does with half the population. So that gives you some idea of where countries like Russia, China, where their focus is in, in universities, is trying to turn out more engineers because that's where the growth is going to come. In, as a sector, uh, pure research and development, manufacturing attracts more than any other sector, which is you know, amazing, really. And the other thing I found fascinating, that 70% of all engineering PhDs that are quite coming out of, of American universities are not American. They're foreigners. And the challenge, again, there is to keep them here to benefit from the education that they've had so they can help you, know, you guys. So this vector, I think, is you know, going to be a massive challenge over the next, the next couple of years, for sure. And as, um, you know, it was, it was interesting, I was in an account not that long ago, and I was um, poking fun at somebody that was slightly younger than me, but it was his 55th birthday, and I was saying you know, how old he was getting and he was losing his hair, et cetera, et cetera. But he turned around to me and said, but the scary thing, Chris, is I'm one of the young ones in this organisation. And we're seeing that demographic really come into play. And I've, I've had some conversations with senior execs that are really worried that there's this skill gap of smart, clever people in that, you know, coming through to replace the people that are retiring. The other arrow is complexity. The products are getting more difficult to manufacture, more difficult to design, more difficult to produce. They're more multidisciplinary. I, I was at an account a couple of months ago that manufactured, um, yeah, come in if you want. That's, that, that um, you know, they manufactured um, bumpers, fenders, whatever you Americans call those big bits of rubber around a car. Um, or plastic, should I say. And he said five, ten years ago, it was just a big bit of plastic. Today, it's got lane deviation sensors, it's got f sensors for reversing and collision, it's got cameras, it's a small computer with a big bit of plastic wrapped around it. Everything is getting more and more complicated. And customers are uh, you know, demanding more complexity, more choice, etc., etc. And that's also adding to the problem. The other thing is data, and this quote that is out there of 2.4 quintillion bytes of data per day, this quote came out from IBM after they did some research in 2014. The general consensus today is that this number is closer to 5 quintillion bytes of data per day. Now, if anybody doesn't know what a quintillion is, it's one with 18 zeros. And, you know, everything is getting connected. Everything is getting smart, right? And so the data being produced is just exponentially growing and growing. And manufacturing companies are just behind the curve on this, significantly behind the curve. I mean, just a sort of a silly little interesting fact that, that the retail industry has been working on this a lot longer than manufacturing. Amazon on every purchase made on Amazon, they increase the revenue between 30 and 65% based on their recommendations. And those recommendations come from data that they've collected about you so they can put back in front of you, oh, you're buying this, what about one of those? Or do you want one in blue as well as red? And so on and so forth. So just think about that. And manufacturing companies are not doing anything like that. There's a British supermarket chain called Tesco's that for their loyal customers, you pick up a trolley, you get your loyalty card, you swipe it on the trolley, and as you're going around the aisles, it knows who you are and will put offers up on the little screen on the trolley in front of you. So as I go past the red wine section, it flashes up that you can get, you know, 
if I'm a young mum and as I'm going down the, the, the baby aisle, it'll flash up that I can buy, you know, baby food or nappies on special offer. And this is real good use of big data, right? Manufacturing companies, not even close, right? And we're the ones, this room, that are producing a lot of this data, right? But we're just not making any use of it. And because it's becoming omnipresent now, you've got, you know, Fitbit on your wrist, you've got doctors now give you a vest that they can monitor information so you don't have to go into hospital. Philips produce a light bulb that will sync with your calendar that turns red if you're late for an appointment. So the idea of interconnected and smart devices is just becoming greater and greater. And what do we do with this big data? Less than 10% of all this information is being collated and even less is being analysed. The latest stats that I have seen, less than 1% of information that manufacturing companies have is being processed and analysed. So there's 99% of this information sat there and we're doing nothing with it, right? And if, it, if, if people like Amazon can increase their spend by 30 to 60%, there's got to be some ways that we can use this information better if we can get access to it, if we can make sense of it and so on and so forth. So this is one of the other pressures that I believe is just, you know, pouring down on the heads of manufacturing companies. And this is sort of, you know, where we are. The first generation, we're at Industry 4.0 now. Industry 4.0 was a, um, I better not walk over there. Um, Industry 4.0 was a, um, a um, scheme for want of a better word, um, introduced by the German government in 2011 to help their manufacturing sector you know, move forward. Um, and we've gone from steam power in the first direction, assembly lines in the second, direct, uh, in the second generation, and I believe I'm right in saying that the first assembly line was in 1870, a slaughterhouse in Birmingham, England. That was where it all started. We've gone through that, and now we're in the third generation was PLCs, um, computers, robots, and now we've got the physical interconnected systems. Over the last 30 years, manufacturing, of in, manufacturing in the US have improved their output by 2.7 times. So this is almost 1x, so doubling output and productivity, doubling every 10 years which is an absolutely phenomenal achievement. But the question is, how do we keep that going with all this stuff going on around us in the, in the background? Because this is the other big thing, right? The Internet of Things. You know, I spoke about that Philips but, um, example, but it's just everywhere. It used to be just big things, right? Jet engines. You know, GE, I think, were the first people to introduce the fact that they could monitor their jet engine relay forward to an airport and say, you need to maintain this in this because this is happening in the engine. But now it's just about everything is interconnected. For those that missed the, um, the story, you can even get a smart hairbrush these days. It's linked to your phone and it tells you how many strokes of the hairbrush you did and whether you were pressing too hard or not. You know, your fridge can tell you if your milk's going out of date. I play golf with a guy that's a um, medical device um, sales rep. And this just, you know, I, I get it, but it was like, really? Wow. He, one of his best sellers is a consumable, which is a, a sponge that they use in theatre. You know, it's a sponge. It's used for sucking up blood, basically. You know, so you've seen it on telly. The doctor's got somebody open and his assistant's in there with a pair of tweezers and this sponge, just getting the blood out of the way and then throwing it away. One of his biggest sellers is a sponge with the GPS tracking device in it. But it's not only so they can find the thing if they lose one. It's also now how long was it in stock, what theatre was it used in, what, what surgeon uses more sponges than any other surgeon, and so on and so forth. I mean, the, the amount of data that we're collecting these days is absolutely phenomenal. And the question again is, with less people, more complexity, more data, how do we survive 
and not only survive, continue that growth path that we've been on for the last three decades of, in, of doubling productivity for everybody in the industry every 10 years? How do we continue on that, that path, basically? I need some, excuse me a second. So one area is business intelligence. But again, manufacturing is behind the curve on business intelligence and you're not using the data that they're getting uh, in smart ways. Now one of the problems is the information that we deal with in this room is different from everybody else. We're not retail, we're not insurance, we're not banking. They tend to have, shall I say, from a technical perspective, easier databases to look after than you guys. You know, where's the 3D CAD database in a bank? And more and more information is going into that type of database these days. You know, the, you know when I first started out in CAD, you know, back in the 70s, it was pretty damn basic. But now there's lots of information in the CAD system, right? Material information, manufacturing information, tolerancing information. So how do you get some of that stuff to talk to information that's in your finance system? Or I hate to say this, you know, especially for the smaller companies in the room, Excel spreadsheets, right? Everybody has them. There's lots of good information in Excel spreadsheets. But, you know, there's no user interface on an Excel spreadsheet, right? It's finding that information that's buried in there is really, really difficult for somebody that, you know, isn't familiar with your Excel spreadsheet. And it's not, I, I say small companies, but, you know, I lie. Um, we were doing some work for, and I won't mention their name because this is truly embarrassing, um, a very known name worldwide considered a very prestigious manufacturing company, British um, they, when we were trying to sort their data discovery issue out and pull data from multiple different data sources to make it available to people so they could start doing some BI, et cetera, et cetera, they gave us access to this spreadsheet that was 3,500 columns by 16,500 rows. It, you know, if that had got corrupt, this company would have stopped producing. I nearly said what they produced. They would have stopped producing. Right? So everybody has this problem, it's just not small companies. So, how does this sort of apply into more manufacturing space before we get into some user examples, etc.? What we see is that this, when, when people are asked for quotes, this front end of the process, the concept, the requirements, the costing, working out the, the quote, etc., Typically, and I don't know what it's like for a lot of companies, but you know, tier one, tier two automotive suppliers, certainly in Michigan, typically will get two weeks to turn a quote around. Now the question is, how can I do that quickly, efficiently, make sure that it's accurate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're always under constant time pressures. And you know, I was at an account actually two weeks ago in Austria, and the guy there, um, or the department there, they produced a thousand quotes roughly a year and they had a 5% success rate. And a lot of the information that they produced at this front end here was not being captured, not being reused, etc., etc. And he, like me, was coming up for retirement. Their best thing was he'd look at something and go, Yeah, I remember this. We did something like this five, six years ago for BMW. And then they'd try and find the information. And his team, that was all in their 20s and 30s, didn't have a damn clue where to look, right? Because they didn't have the experience. It was all in somebody's head. You know, with the demographic changes, the shortage of people, the complexity, et cetera, the data, you know, it can't be in here anymore. You've got to make it um, software related. And of course, once somebody gets the, the purchase order here and it starts to populate Plex, well, it's all hunky-dory, it's all there, you've got one repository, it's great. But what about all that information up the front that is equally valuable? How do you sort of manage that and get it into the system? And even people with PDM and PLM systems, I typically find that they're only capturing a very small percentage of the information that's before that PO. 
So it sees the, some of the industry challenges. How do you gather all this product data together? And we've already said the product, the amount of data is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, so this problem is getting worse. How do we sort of corral that and get it in one place? Tracking the initial development efforts, the quoting process, why the decisions were made, was it profitable, and so on and so forth. Communicating the data and visibility to the data. You know, if this, see if I can get this pointer to work here. No, I can't. But the, the thing at the top there, you've got all these people, right? How do you get the information into their hands so that they can see the information? Look, we, we make things. People need access to the thing that you're manufacturing, be it's a 3D CAD model or the information that goes around it. But, you know, you're not going to give everybody in your organisation access to the ERP system in the same way that you're not going to give everybody access to the CAD system or access to the PDM, PLM system or the CRM system or any other three-letter acronym you care to mention that relates to another database. And the reason you can't do it is it's too expensive, it's too complicated, and, you know, people can't remember the user interface. I mean, here's a really sad story. I used to run the European operation uh, at Dassault for the smart team business, their PLM system. We used to keep our finances in the smart team system because we thought that was smart. We would use our own software to manage data, blah, 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 right? I used to have to go into that system once every four, six weeks to find the financials I was looking for and get the reports I wanted. And I knew it was in there somewhere, in this labyrinth of a database, along with all the other stuff that we used to have in there. And I knew it was there. And I'd spend a couple of hours looking for it before I'd lose my patience, march down the hall, bang on the CFO's door and say, can I have a, an Excel spreadsheet with this stuff on it? Right? It's impossible for people out here to constantly go to, you know, 10 different databases, right? It's just not going to happen. So the three vectors and what does it mean for you guys? Well, I think one of the first ones fundamentally is you can't have smart people doing mundane, boring stuff. You can't have them wandering around an organisation asking people for information that perhaps buried in an Excel spreadsheet, buried in a CAD system or buried in some other system, right? It's just A, dumb, and nobody in this room can afford it because these people are smart, skilled, you know, you've got to get over it. You've got to have software do the routine work. You've got to have it, you've got to automate that mundane process. And you've got to start using the data better because once you've got the data, you might be able to do something with it, make some insights into the business that you can't see today. I mean, I'm not joking. I went into one, um, he was an um, executive vice president of a decent sized manufacturing company. I went into his office and his desk was literally spread out with Excel spreadsheets and Word documents and he's trying to join the dots, basically. Yeah, that relates to this bit over here and that relates to, yeah. This was an expensive, intelligent guy that was doing that sort of work, right? Everybody in this room can't afford your companies and your staff doing that sort of stuff. It, you got to improve it, got to have software do that sort of stuff for you, as opposed to try and have people doing it. Because as I said here, you know, in this graph, next decade, there's going to be two million unfilled jobs because you just can't find the right people. So as I like to refer to it as the iceberg problem. You've got all this stuff, all this information. It's in your organisation. And often now your products are producing even more information that's going into databases. You know, the example with the surgical sponge on who's using it, how long it's been on the shelf, blah, 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 all that. All of this is going into different databases, CAD, engineering, Excel, CRM, et cetera, et cetera. How much of it is actually visible to anybody in your organisation at the, you know, at the drop of a hat instantly? Typically, people have to sort of collate this information. Did some work for Jaguar Land Rover. They literally had a, what they call a design review manager that would walk around to all the groups that were designing the car and get a status report. Where are you? What are the problems? How far have you got on this? Any problems? What about you guys? And at the end of the week, they'd have a meeting on where they were. 
Well, by the time they had the meeting, obviously the information was out of date for one thing. And the other thing that when we automated the process for them, what they started to see was that all of a sudden everything started to turn green as a gate was coming up. So they were just, it's a bit like the, the salesman giving the sales manager the number that he wants to hear. In the engineering environment, it was the design managers were giving their managers the information. Now it's all good, we're going to hit the gate, we're going to hit the milestone, everything's fine. And then two days later, everything will start turning red again. And it was only after we automated that process that their manager was saying, stop guys, look, we can see what's happening, tell us the truth because we can actually see it, let's focus on the issues you've got instead of, you know, BS. <clears throat> so it's how much information is actually available to you. And so what we're doing as an organisation is corralling all this information, collating in all this information, and we're not doing all the information, we're just taking out the nuggets, the interesting bits, the bits that are important to you, and making that visible, whether it's in a dashboard or pushing it into another system like Plex. So, some of the problems, and now we get into the actual user experiences, you know, there's no good integration of CAD into Plex. You're not going to load a large assembly file up into the Plex system in the cloud, right? It's just not practical. You've got PMI and GD&T callouts in the, in the CAD system that are difficult to get into Plex unless you, you know, type them up again, which is, you know, not exactly practical or easy. And 3D duplicates, everybody has them. It's just a question of how many and how do you uh, organize them, right? So this collation of data from multiple data sources could include you know, dates, quoting, prototypes, people responsible, cost material, et cetera, et cetera, and you need one place where you can find all this information. So here's some examples of some sheets that with some web pages that we've done some of, some of our customers, and as I said, this is sort of an amalgamation of um, use cases that we've done for several different um, uh, customers of ours. So in this case, they have this birth certificate, so when they get a request for a quote in through the door, the first thing they do is they create a new job, right? And here, instead, it used to be an Excel spreadsheet, but so what we did, we automated the Excel spreadsheet. There's pull downs for the people responsible, there's program information, manufacturing location, in this case is Germany, expected volume, et cetera, et cetera, dates, and so on and so forth. And then as soon as they get that purchase order, they can press a button, all that information gets automatically uploaded into Plex. There's no retyping any data or anything like that. And then Plex knows that this is where this information comes from. It pushes information of financials back down onto this sheet and with shipping information, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a bi-directional um, process between the two. In another case, routing information. Um, I need to be kind to Plex about this, so I'll, phrase, I'll get the phrase correct here. Inputting routing information into Plex is not the most elegant solution. There we go. That was a good way of putting it. <coughs> so what we did for this particular customer is you know, we pulled over the, the 3D image. So that's actually a live 3D image in the center of the screen there. They can rotate it, do cross sections, measurements. So that's come from the CAD system. There's some other information that has come from some other places. And then when somebody puts in the manufacturing location, they can only then do those routing operations and they can just simply add operations down the bottom, et cetera. When they've got that complete, they simply press a button and that information is then automatically uploaded into Plex. Again, Plex information can automatically be pushed back down into this sheet, so it's in one sheet. So if somebody's not got access to Plex, they can find the information they need here, like financials, for instance. And the other cool thing is, if somebody in manufacturing says, actually, I'm going to change this order around about the routing, or I'm going to delete something, etc., as soon as they do it in Plex, it's again automatically reflected in this sheet, so everybody's on the same page. This is a really cool one, in my opinion. We've got another customer 
that has a lot of GDMT callouts, tolerancing information on their CAD system. Now, prior, what they were doing is actually copying that out to an Excel spreadsheet. Somebody would type it up, give it to somebody else that would input that information into the Plex inspection sheet. Now, at the press of a button, the software completely sweeps the CAD system, grabs all of that GD&T tolerancing information, and automatically populates the, the inspection sheet over on this side. Now, the thing about GD&T and tolerancing information, for those that are familiar with it, is one typo can completely screw the whole thing and you've got an unmanufacturable part. You know, you type in a D instead of a C, for instance, for the datum, you're screwed. You make a, a decimal point error in one of those tolerances, you're screwed, right? So being able, to, again, take out the mundane, take out the, the repetition, and have software do all this stuff automatically, frees up some smart people to do things they should be doing, right? Now, the other thing is that we're seeing more and more is that companies are global. So to do this properly, you've got to have a system that can operate on a global basis and have a distributed architecture, right? So um, one of our customers um, right now has, has deployed um, in Czech Republic, UK, Germany, Troy, Michigan, I'm forgetting somewhere, Shanghai, okay? Now, anybody within that network can now see the other people's information. Have we done a similar part like this before and get some real benefits from it? So it's about not just collating information from one single location, but doing it on a global basis so that you can start to make economies of scale in there as well. Have I manufactured this part before? If so, where did I do it? Where's the information and so forth? and have that presented to you instead of you needing to go and share it. I was going to do this now, but I think I might be running out of time, so I'm going to move on to this slide. <coughs> the other thing is 3D search. So every company that we've engaged with on this subject, there's always been duplicates. And for us, what a duplicate is, is it's a, a, a sh an identical shape. Okay, something identical like this, but with a different part number in the ERP system. And it happens a lot, right? We have never come across a company that didn't have at least 6% duplicates in their database. And I, but with this embedded into the system and the, collation, the collation of data from multiple different data sources, I mean, some of our customers are now doing things like they get a, a, a request for quoting from an OEM they bring it up on the screen, and they can now say to the system, okay, have I manufactured anything that looks like this or similar to this in the past? And the system will go away and sweep the database and come back and say, you've got these things that are similar. This is how much it cost you. This was the profit margin. This is where you manufactured it. This was the engineer responsible. Now, you try and imagine doing that today without a system that's going around sweeping up all the information from multiple different data sources, including the ERP system. That's almost impossible. Well, it is impossible. And what happens is people are forced into getting quotes out quickly. They're not sure if they're accurate. They're not sure if they're going to make any money on them, and so on and so forth. But if you can corral all this information and start making use of it, right, that's the sort of stuff you can do with it. The other thing is, the other byproduct is, if you've got visibility to all this information, you can start mashing it together and produce dashboards. The one at the top, actually, that's partially hidden is the Jaguar Land Rover example. Down the left-hand side is all the modules of the car. Across the, going across are all the sub-assemblies in each module of that car. Green means it's good to go. Red means there's a problem. And there's also this heat map scenario where you can drill down and focus on those red areas that are the big problems. So it's another example of collating lots of information from different data sources, including Excel spreadsheets, and just 
S SQL, et cetera, et cetera, pulling it all together, being able to make use of it. And because what we're now seeing as well is the introduction of Internet of Things and the information that's being pulled in there. So how do you make use of that information along with all the information that's also in your organization, in your CAD system, in your PDM system, PLM system, ERP system, and so on, right? This is a great way of being able to pull all that information together and get a visual on where the important things are, okay? And it's no longer a case of having somebody going around spending days collecting all this information. It can now be done for you automatically. So we see ourselves as the bridge between silos of information, bringing people closer to their data, and you know, less obstacles, greater visibility. Also a bridge between not just information silos, but also on-premise and the cloud. Because we find that there's just some things that are always going to be on-premise and some things in, how do you get the things that, that are on-premise into the cloud without somebody having to retype it in, right? And that's one of the things that we see ourselves as the bridge. Um, and it's two-way, so Plex information can also come back on premise and populate things like the CAD system. This thing costs you X number of dollars. The lead time on this is Y. We got this from a supplier and it cost us this much, right? All that information can also be available to you. Um, I won't bore you with the, the technical side of a graph database, but that's basically what the system's built on top of. So. It's a question of removing the human intervention. You know, I started this whole thing by, by uh, you know, telling you about how people are going to be a huge bottleneck going forward. So how do you make them more efficient? And the way you make them more efficient is by taking away these routine tasks and these main, mon mundane jobs. You get the clever people focused on the clever stuff, not in collating data, right? <coughs> And if you do that, you get greater visibility, reduced errors. You know, the example with the um, tolerancing information going directly into Plex. One typo. One typo can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So you've got to make sure that's you know, automated and you take out the human element as much as possible. So in conclusion, better use of data. Once you've created it once, don't do it again. Reuse it, reuse it, reuse it, right? <coughs> and, you know, remember the iceberg. You've got all this information. You've already got this information. And that information, that, that amount below the waterline is just getting bigger and bigger because of Internet of Things, you know, smart devices connected, etc. You know, if, if, a, if a sponge can become, suddenly become smart, most of your products are really going to be clever, right? It's just the fact of life. This is just going to get worse and worse. And once you've got the information, you can certainly make um, faster, smarter business decisions. And as I like to say, get the software to do all the grunt rather than clever people. And that, I believe, is my presentation. Pretty much 45 minutes as directed. So any questions from anybody? Was it interesting? I did a border pants off you all. <laughs> well, at least I'm getting a few nods on the, the interesting bit, which is good. Thank goodness for that. Otherwise, it would, my time would have been wasted. So, any questions, anybody? Then they can track him home. They know where to go and get it. Yeah. But that's actually, that, was one, that is one of their value statements. It's one lawsuit, right? This sponge may cost you 10 times as much as that other dumb sponge. One lawsuit, you've paid for it for probably, you know, five years. And that's why, how they sell them. But the interesting thing I found, that's an interesting, the, the sales pitch is interesting. Okay, it does away with the lawsuit. What I found even more fascinating was the medical device company tracking all the information so they now know what surgeons use more swabs than any other surgeon, how long it's been in the, um, the, the, uh, the warehouse, basically, waiting to be used at the hospital, how long it spends in the theatre. You know, that information, and they're starting to use that to increase their sales, which I thought was, you know, amazing, right? Well, if there's no more questions, folks, thanks very much for your time. Hope you found it interesting. Enjoy the rest of PowerPlex. Thanks.